welcome to the Good Girl Confessional. I am your host, Sandy Lowrys, and the Good Girl Confessional is proudly brought to you by WB40 magazine, Women Beyond 40. Today in the confessional, I am super excited to be talking to a really genuinely lovely person. Her name is Lou Duggan. She is the founder and creator of Cake to the Rescue. Uh, We shared her story in WB40 issue 6 of the magazine um, and I really wanted to have her on the podcast to have a chat about her amazing business and how she went from being an interior designer and an engineer to actually heading up a cake kit business. Try to say that quickly. Lou is passionate about what she does, but really the the inspiring thing about what she does is she doesn't just send you out a cake kit. She has an amazing community of people and she's present and whole. And really it's about not so much about your cake making skills as it is about building your confidence and feeling supported in a community of other women. I love that. So I'm so thrilled. I know you're going to love her. Please welcome to the confessional, Lou Duggan. Hello and welcome to the confessional. Lou, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you today because we've actually just featured you in the latest issue, issue six of WB40 magazine. So exciting. Thank you so much. (laughs) It just was so lovely to, to write for you. It was really awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it's so lovely to hear your story as well. So first of all, I should say you're a busy mum. You've got three children of your own um, and your business, um, Cake to the Rescue, is basically out there saving other parents from a whole lot of stress and and uh, and drinking too much wine the night before a party. I'm Absolutely, <laughs> 100%. Yeah, so Cake to the Rescue, it's a DIY cake cake company. I had um, I was a Martha when my kids were little I was that mother that you don't really like you know the one that paints herself green at Halloween and has the whole class (laughs) in and I think I was so insecure about being a bad parent that I somehow thought if I morphed into Martha Stewart that was the requirement or something like that (laughs) and um but with my two youngest girls they were actually two days apart they were two years apart but two days apart and we used to do these ridiculous joint birthday parties and I'd set myself ridiculous expectations for what they what I should create for their birthdays and so I'd be up at 3 a.m making these cakes my husband would be just ready to kill me he'd be like I'm going to bed you can you can just stay up (laughs) and um, and so um, it got to this point of like there must be a better way to be doing this and yeah so Cake to the Rescue initially was created as this cake kit that meant that you could decide the cake you wanted to make for your child. We send you everything you need. You don't have to run around. We make it easy to achieve because I'm not a cake lady. I'm a a geologist, interior designer, and engineer. (laughs) We'll um, we'll get to that. (laughs) So it was like this thing of, of, okay, we're going to make it easy for you. And so we really started the business thinking, if we give you the kit, then you'll be good at it. Um, But it didn't pan out that way, as I'm sure we'll discuss about. We realized that a kit is not the only thing that parents need in order to make this work. They actually need a whole lot more personal support and and self-belief. And so it's been a journey, um, but I love it. I've been doing it for 10 years now. And uh, yeah, I... It's such a cool job. I get to use my left and right brain. I'm a bit of a lefty and a righty. And uh, yeah, I kind of can't believe it's my job really it's very cool it is so fantastic and especially because I love that you say you were a Martha um if you were a Martha then I was the the main protagonist of the handmade <laughs> tale <laughs> <laughs> Learning how to rebel and anything that I could outsource, I outsourced. Um, and you know, at the, I, I remember, like you know, for a long time, I was a single parent, you know, raising yeah. three kids after a divorce. And you know, like as you say, the, the amount of pressure you put on yourself to try and make it right and to get it all done. And I am not much of a baker, Lou. Yeah. That's my confession <laughs> for the day. Um, <laughs> and I always had the one thing, even if I didn't really have a lot of money, the one thing that I always outsourced was cake because I just didn't feel confident enough to yeah. make something that everyone was going to say wow that that's great and it looks great and it tastes great 
Absolutely. And I mean, my kids are 21, 19 and 17. So the pressure, I don't think there was any Instagram. So the pressure wasn't <laughs> as huge. I mean, you still didn't want to look like an idiot in front of your friends, but the pressure wasn't as ridiculous as it is now where you must yeah. look perfect while presenting the color coordinated cake that matches your perfect decoration that costs more than a small car. And, 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 and you wait for the world to critique you on it as you put it on social media. So I would hate to have it now. I think it's now it needed more than ever. Whereas when my kids were young, it was really only your friendship and your ego that really determined whether you'd done a good job or not. But um, I probably had too much time on my hands when the kids were little. My husband worked overseas in China. I had three kids under five, so I couldn't work. I had a little bit of a part-time interior design job where I just took on jobs for friends and repeat customers. But I had all the time in the world and I was bored senseless. So becoming Martha as a creative was my way of escaping from really being bored as a mom, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but but now everyone's at work, everyone's time poor. So many people rely on both sets of income to run a household. and But we still want to be like our mothers. We still want to somehow create everything that the stay-at-home mom creates while trying to do our job. So I think that's what's so important about the kid. It's not about creating this magnificent thing where everyone's like holy smokes how many days did that take you it's about creating something that's saying that's kind of cool it looks great I made it myself and it, it's just it gets the job done you make it in two or three hours but you still get to feel like that mum that you have perceived you want to be so it's it's a nice compromise between ridiculous perfectionism and just just pouring your love into a homemade cake really which is what it's all about anyway and I think that that you've hit the nail on the head, I guess, is why your business is so successful because people want to pour love into what they do for their children, regardless of what we do. I was always that crazy working mum, but as you say, my children are 30, 24 and 21 and I sure as hell didn't have that. Um, yeah. I will say though with my kids, there's very, you know, the, you take the photos of their birthdays and as you say, there's always a, a, a photo of the cake even back then. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty grateful it was wasn't my messy cake out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I wish you'd been around when I was raising my kids because I think it's such a great idea. I would have loved to have like baked, you know, a homemade cake for my kids. I just didn't feel confident. So you talked before about that being a major issue for most of us as mothers. Like for we're sure. so worried about everything. And as you say now, with Instagram, with social media, um, there is such an expectation on these people's shoulders to have these extraordinarily beautiful birthday parties, <laughs> curated, I like to call them, curated parties. I mean, we didn't see anything like that unless it was a lavish kind of, you know, um, ballroom function that you went to. And now this is like people's mainstream life. And who um, is it for? It's I not. Don't know. It's not for the child. It, the, the, the necessity to have this perfect colour-coordinated party, we all know children are not colour-coordinated anyone who's watched their child dress themselves and come down with stripy pants zigzag tops <laughs> a polka dot scarf hot pink hat and blue shoes kids Gum just, boots. kids just don't <laughs> care less so it's kind of we've lost the purpose of what it's what it's for and I always say that kids need two things they need your love and they need your time and everything else is inconsequential in our group lots of mothers write it's not perfect but and But I can guarantee that by the time they get to the end of the paragraph, it says, but my child absolutely loved it and they thought it was the best cake they've ever seen. And so I think that's the thing. You've got the parent perception at the start and the kid's reality at the end. And um, And so I think that, I think if we can somehow focus back on the fact that all, it, all we're really going to be judged by in the end is our children god help us uh, <laughs> I look at how I judged my particularly my dad I, I kind of felt like my dad gave me a hard time when I was a kid and I look back now on it and I think gosh I'd hate my kids to say judge me the way that I judged mine and what they did for me it, it's amazing how much more mellow you become about your parents job after you worry of the terror of your ch kids judging you as adults as well it, it certainly oh, makes yeah. you much kinder in it your really thought <laughs> <laughs> it really does and I guess you know this is the thing about 
um, you know, women and wisdom, right? We gain our wisdom through, uh, you know, the hardcore learning and hands-on life experience. I mean, that's where yes. it comes from. And you're right. I think as we get older, you know, what, what's that expression? It's funny how um, how much smarter your parents seem as you get older. And <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatism is an amazing thing. I always think that that's the one thing the world could gain, a little pragmatism. I mean, we want passion. Sure, we want passion and excitement, but there's a lot to be said for pragmatism. Pragmatism is a beautiful a beautiful trait and it makes life so much easier. Uh, yeah, sure. you're so true. <laughs> that's, you're so right. And I think you hit the nail on the head, who is it really for? And so your beautiful company is really saying to parents, it's not just mothers, but to parents mm. um, that, you know, if you pour your love into this cake for this child, I guarantee it's going to be great and your child's going to love it. And I'm sure that children will look back and say, oh, my mum made that for me. Or well, my dad made that for me, and that's that's important. It's a dramatic responsibility on my part. Um, we have a Facebook community, so I'm very much on with my customers every day. They all know me. I'm on live. I'm on live with no bra on some days. Some days I'm dressed up. Some days I'm not. Some days, it's like, yeah. <laughs> some days it's like, oh, that would be funny. I'll just put that on now. And I just, I've reached the moment where I just switch the camera on without really filtering first or thinking what I'm going to say. It's just caught in a moment. And it's beautiful because they get the real version of me um, and it lets them be the real version of themselves. But I have a responsibility because they know who I am and I know who they are. I often say Betty Crocker doesn't put up with this rubbish because she doesn't get the <laughs> phone calls on the back of the packet. But I love that relationship. But what it means is, is my responsibility to not let them down is, is, is dramatic. It's like you can imagine that if they, if they do struggle with something, it's on my social media page. Um, you know, saying, hey, Lou, this is what's happened to me. I'm directly responsible for everything. So I always say, I'm not saying that your cake doesn't have to be perfect in that it can look horrific. We're going we're gonna to do everything we can to make you look really like a hot baker. But if there's a couple of crumbs in the backside of it where no one can see, or there's a little smudge of red icing that's gone over the fondant, you're going to have to cut yourself some slack here. And so it's finding that balance of, of making people look really, really good so that people are like, did you make that? And somehow allowing them to just stuff a little bit, one eye smaller than the other, one whatever it is, the tiniest minute thing that mothers will now focus on. I, I paint and I can look at the entire painting and I can see that one, that one little flub I made in the corner and no one else can see it. And so, yeah, there's, I feel a monster responsibility um, to, to fulfill my promise that if someone places their trust, that I say they're going to be okay, that they will be. And that's a mixture of two things. That's a mixture of doing, making the kit right, but also providing the emotional support that their expectation is nurtured and that they have a safe space there's no so few safe spaces in the world um those cake groups have you been on any of those oh, there's a few <laughs> <laughs> they're full of three-tiered masterpieces of people pretending that they're hobby bakers but they're actually cake decorators um, who are advertising in groups, but they're intimidating the living bejesus out of everybody else that's just trying to string two <laughs> bits together for their kid on the weekend. So, yeah, I, I, it's definitely, yeah, the responsibility of making them, making them feel good and look good has become my entire focus. I do sell cake now, but what I really sell is self-confidence and, and the message that you're going to be enough regardless that you were I always say you were born enough you are enough now and you will be enough tomorrow and um, I feel like that's my job and it's really interesting because I'm very insecure human being always have been my whole life spent most of I don't think I even really liked myself till I was about 40 I wasn't a person who thought I was particularly great but I was really good at championing and everyone else and I've had to listen to myself so much in these last few years, like writing articles for the magazine and doing things that I've had no choice but to accept that that counts for me too, Lou. By the way, Lou, you're enough. You've always <laughs> been enough. You are enough and you will continue to be yes. enough. So I've had to learn 
to love myself, if I'm going to love everyone else and tell them to love themselves, I'm probably going to have to walk the walk at some point. And um, so, yeah, I think for about the last six years, I'm 46 now, I've liked myself. And um, I just want everyone else to get there a whole lot quicker than I did. Yeah. And, and if I, if I feel like it's like serendipitous that I've somehow ended up this person who is teaching other people, is mentoring them to love themselves. It's it's such a beautiful full circle moment. I feel like the world put me exactly where where they I was supposed to be. Um, it's kind of cool. It's very very cool. Very cool. Oh my god, there's a lot to unpack there, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm such a blabber. No, it's brilliant. (laughs) It's so brilliant because I think what you've just expressed is what a lot of women feel, Mm -hmm. that in order for us to keep supporting other people and help other people to rise is that we really do have to figure out a way to like ourselves, love ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the cliche stuff, they're cliches for a reason because they're real. Mm -hmm. Like how can you fill up someone else's cup if you haven't filled up your own? But I do think there is a massive kind of movement at the moment for women, especially older women, women over the age of 40, over the age of 50, etc., mm. who there's a sort of a groundswell of people going, oh, actually, I really like who I am and I'm okay with that and basically screw you, society, you can't yeah. tell me otherwise. And to um, say it out loud. Say it out loud. And that is what our platform is about as well, WB40. Mm. And you're right, how do you support other women and help other women to rise and say, yeah. God, you, you, you're brilliant and you're amazing and look at all the things you're doing if you don't actually believe it yourself, yourself. right? You've got it. You're right. At some point, mm-hmm. you do have to walk the walk. The really fantastic thing about being over 40 and wait till you get to be over 50. I'm so is- excited. <laughs> is that you really don't give as much weight to what other people think, Mm. right? And that you value your own opinion of yourself. And that's a huge thing for all of us to learn, right? It's pretty special. I'm still there. I'm not quite there yet. Like I would say, the funniest thing is because I'm the youngest of all my friends. So I had my children at 24, 26 and 28. I got married at 22. I've been married 25 years this, uh, this year coming. And and so I was always the one behind. And they were always like, when you turn 40, blah, 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 blah. And I used to think, oh, yeah, whatever. And then now I actually have never felt so good about myself. And so I can't wait for 50 because I'm like, gosh, I'm going to be bulletproof by the time I'm 50. And I, I've never been so excited to age in my whole <laughs> life. It's just There's just this sense of... Um, calm I I have a girl that started working for me last year and she's 36 and she her children are exactly at the stage that mine were 10 years ago and I've um I've become this source for her and I I watch how she talks and and what concerns her how it is and I see myself in her and she luckily sees herself in me and she can see where she may end up and and that she will get through this stage of that you have in your 30s um yeah being in my 40s is a luxury it's just the best (laughs) thing ever I don't know why people dread it I'm like god bring it on when can I be 50 I was uh, really excited to turn 40 and my friends all thought I was a bit nutty but (laughs) I I don't know I think I just perceived that no one really took me all that seriously in my 30s. And I kind of felt like, oh, you wait till I'm 40. You'll have to (laughs) take me seriously. I think, and then the really interesting thing for me is I was sort of actually, I was concerned, I think, heading at 49 to go, wow, I'm 50 next year and what does that even mean? Mm. But in actual fact, I decided to go in hard and had a huge big celebration when I turned 50 with all my friends and whatever it was so fantastic to celebrate it's such a milestone and I feel yeah. really grateful to be here when so many people are not but yeah, it's a privilege I, of aging right so, uh, I feel so privileged and and you know that my children are grown-ups my baby my youngest baby is 21 I mean that's even wow. hard for me to believe that now but they're independent and so now I have all this time on my hands and I have, you know what, I'm, like I don't have the same level, you always worry about your children, but I don't have the same level of emotional labour going on yes. of taking care of every minute thing for every single person in my family um, because they're grown-ups. So you have to tell me, so my eldest one's 21, I have 19 and 17, and I, because I got married so young, I had my midlife crisis when I was about 35. 
And um, and so for me now, the idea of them kind of leaving home and 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 the next stage of our life and, and what that looks like. Um, I'm now, right now, because my business is at its most successful, like I finally feel like I can tick the box. Cake to the rescue will survive. It's a product that will live in the world. It will outsee me, um, outlive me. And therefore I'm left at this moment of what is it I want to craft next for my life? What, what, where do I want my life to be? What, where do I want to operate within Cake to the Rescue? And, and I'm struggling between selfish choices and choices that I feel sound good when you tell people. I've always wanted to have a cooking show on television. Since I was a little child, I had a little um, suitcase and I'd place a tea towel over it. And I had all these little square blocks for building blocks. And I would pretend that the pink ones were ham and the yellow ones were cheese. And I'd do these cooking shows in my bedroom. But now when I'm like, someone's like, you would love to do the cooking show. I'm like, I would, but I don't feel like I have a really great reason to tell someone why I should be doing it. I just want to do it because I think it would be really fun. I think I'd be really good at it and I'd really like to do it. But I feel like I should be saying I want to save the world one healthy vegetable at a time or I should be. I don't know if it's because I'm older that I feel like I should have a social responsibility to every decision I make that somehow it's wrong to make a decision that feels ego-based or or only to serve yourself. So I'm stuck in there. I'm I wondering really where you go from there. Have you been there? <laughs> that oh, yeah. moment of deciding, well, now I'm a grown-up and I've made this money and I'm successful. Surely what I do should be social, socially um, helping society in more than just my own ego. And But I really would like to just do it for me <laughs> and I won't give myself permission to do it. I, I think that's really a fascinating thing that you raised and I'm really glad you were honest about it because I, I think a lot of women go through this when they're building something and then they suddenly think, I find it really fascinating that you actually called it selfish, that I'm, I'm, you know, what I want for myself is selfish. And I think herein lies the big thing for women and how much the patriarchy and society have con have basically conditioned us to believe that mm. if we want something for ourselves that that is called selfish, sure. um, right? Where in actual fact, if uh, what I'm finding for myself in creating Women Beyond 40 magazine, having the Good Girl Confessional podcast, in, in doing that one thing for me that I was so passionate about and I always wanted to do, in actual fact, what I have done and am doing is helping other women, helping yes. other women to share their stories, giving them a platform to actually write for a magazine or to, to be interviewed for a magazine. Um, women who, you know, may have been overlooked by other mainstream media. And so you end up by default helping others because you're filling yourself up. Yes. And so my mission was always, I very much knew my why, and my why was I was really passionate about facing ageism head on. And I, and mm. I was really angry at how women get treated beyond the age of 40, 50, 60. Yeah. And I, in, in all corners of the world, in the media and in their corporate life or in their jobs or trying to get funding for startups and I was mad. So I started <laughs> it <laughs> as a way of actually giving a platform to other women to share their experiences mm. and to give to get them out into the world really the interesting part for me is you've already answered your why I think like you're saying oh, I can't figure out why do I want to do it I can't figure out a reason to tell people why I want a cooking show <laughs> you can hear in your voice how incredibly passionate you are about what you do and cooking. And the moment you start talking about the cooking show and being a little girl, your your face lights up. <laughs> and you've answered it yourself. I was a storyteller from the time I, I could talk, even before I could yeah. write. So it made sense I'd want to be a writer and that I've continued down that path. Obviously, you as a little girl always wanted to be a baker you wanted to be a cook you wanted to be a chef or whatever you wanted to be in the kitchen and have a cooking show there's your answer that little girl is still inside of you saying so let me out let me out <laughs> <laughs> and she's already done all those other careers I think what's interesting because um I often hear a lot of people terrified about what if I don't know my why and when I started Kate to the rescue I certainly didn't 
start Cake to the Rescue to save women one cake at a time. <laughs> and, um, and I just did it because I was good at it. You know, yeah. it was something I was good at. I knew I was capable of doing it. And so we did it. My why showed itself to me by following my passion. And maybe that's the next, maybe that's the same attitude I need to take to this next step in my life. Because certainly I'm not a pastry chef. I'm not a baker. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's that fraud thing of that whole thing. You know, I'm a, uh. <laughs> um, that I'm not a, what's the genius of Kate to the Rescue is my lack of skill set. The reason why our kits are so good is because I can't bake. And so if I can make them, I, I am an interior designer and an engineer. So I have super good creative um, visual spatial awareness and I have engineering uh, logical intelligence around procedures and, and creating things. When you put those two things together, it makes you a really smart person for telling someone how to do something that is non-creative. It's kind of like paint by numbers for cake. And so maybe it's that thing of, well, I'm not a, I'm not a chef. I, I haven't been making my own special pasta from scratch since I was this. It, it's that love of saying to someone, you don't have to be good. You actually, we can make you look good just by doing this and make you feel great and let you get on with your life. And, um, and so maybe it's a bit of that. Maybe it's that, that thing of, um, you know, you haven't been, you know, what's that great guy? Well, well, maybe, maybe Morgan. Have... <laughs> you know the donut guy, Morgan? What's yeah, Morgan yeah. called? And he's like from the age of seven, he's had his apron on and he's been making things yes. and he had his donut shop from the age of 13. And it's such a cool thing. Maybe we think we're too old or we, yeah. Maybe it's the, oh, uh -huh. there it is, uh -huh. and therein lies the thing. <laughs> Hence, why I started my platform because I don't believe anyone is ever too old. And what I find on a, you know on a daily basis, I get to meet so many brilliant, cool women, um, like your good self, who are capable capable of all these amazing things and doing really amazing things and having success with it. We are limited by our own beliefs as women. I really believe that, and a lot of the time, imposter syndrome is a bitch. I mean, she creeps in. I, I guarantee there's not a female entrepreneur out there who doesn't feel it or a female writer or a female creative. We all feel it. Um, but I also think that we denigrate ourselves in terms of age. Am I too old? Who's going to take me seriously? Yeah. Um, but I think you've obviously got passion and maybe maybe we'll see a Lou Duggan cook show maybe. That's, going, that's going to be about, listen, don't worry if you're half assed it's going to be great. It tastes good in the end. <laughs> what is wrong with I'd watch that. I would think that was amazing. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe if I get out of my own way one of these days. <laughs> and if not, I really like Kate to the Rescue. <laughs> like I'm I am already backpedaling. <laughs> <laughs> already. But, you know, keep it on there. I think that if we nurture that inner child, if we really go back to what did we want to do when we were children, what gives us joy is when we were children, it's really amazing how much joy you can get out of it as an adult, honestly. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about the many hats that you have worn because your background is extraordinary. So not only an interior um, decorate designer interior designer mm -hmm. but also an engineering background I find that really fascinating especially because engineering mm -hmm. is such a male dominated space yeah tell us how you went from in like yeah what made you decide to jump from engineering to interior design how did all of that work yeah so basically I was really I was really smart at school and when you're really smart you tend to get pushed down the math science section of life and and so I was just um, I, I kind of worked out what am I going to do? I lived in a small town in Scotland and I was really into geography and um, maths and physics and all these kind of things. And I ended up doing a degree in geology and I got about three years through my degree in geology. And the last year was a year of looking at rocks. And I'm like, I want to look at rocks for a year. And it also suddenly occurred to me that I could either be a nutty professor studying seismic seismic things and, and rocks in university or I was going to have to go live in the North Sea and drill for oil so I decided it wasn't for me and my father had this um, like a consultancy business of the math and physics behind engineering of steel foundries and he was traveling the world doing really smart things and making a lot of money and at 19 I was like 
I'll do that. And so he had two daughters and my sister was running all the logistics, um, shipping and all the things of it. And I said to my dad, maybe I would like a shot at this. And so I finished my last year of my geology degree and did a master's in material science engineering and ended up working in steel foundries in my summer holidays to get work experience because as the only woman if as a woman, especially in that time, this would be it's not that long ago, but like when would it be? Nineteen nineties, early nineteen nineties, I was gonna walk into a male dominated industry and give them technical advice and technical sales advice and try and sell things to them. As a woman, the only way to do that was to work in every job in the steel foundry. So I spent my summers working on the furnace, working on the molding floor, um, working. And then I trained as a methods engineer, which is a very specific type of engineer. And I absolutely loved it. And I did it. Um, I then met my husband, moved to Australia um, to be with him, did my thesis uh, on sand in a steel foundry, and then proceeded to get a job there. And working in the steel foundry, I loved. I loved being the only woman because I was Scottish. My swearing was well and truly up to par. So <laughs> I fitted in like a glove. Yeah, and I um, <laughs> and I absolutely loved every second of it. And the I used to the they used to say, but doesn't everyone perv on you all day? And I'm like, when you're the only woman in the place, you hope they are looking. Because if they're <laughs> not looking, and then all the older men would gather you in like a like a father figure and I loved every second of it but when I had my first child and I had to move into the sales the whole reason I was working in the steel foundry was to become this technical sales person where you sold the goods but you provided the intelligent technical math physics stuff that I'd been training in and I realized I hated sales like hated it hated it um I'm not really good at ripping people off. In fact, the fact that I think sales is ripping people off as a terminology also tells you that I have a weird thing around sales. And the other thing I don't like is sucking up to people in order to get what I want. And I also don't like misogyny. And so therefore, <laughs> it didn't go well for me because <laughs> in order to get these middle-aged men to sell to this 24-year-old girl, because I was so young at the time, um, I had to suck up to them, listen to their misogyny, take them to strip clubs and drinks. And also, <laughs> I know when I think about it now, I was so young. And then... I had to slightly rip them off in order to make money. And the whole thing just made me feel sick. So yeah. I secretly studied interior design without telling my father. And I, I realized that I missed creativity because I was so good at creativity, but I'd just been smart my whole life. And so smart is where you get pushed when you're smart. So I retrained as an interior designer when I was pregnant with my third child. And... Um, started the interior design company, told my father that that's what I was going to do. And he said, great, a degree in soft furnishings, just what this family needs. And <laughs> uh, it, was just, it was it was really bad. It was really bad at the time. He was he felt so let down by my decision because oh. I was good at my job. It just didn't make my heart sing. And then I was an interior designer for 10 years while I brought up because I had three kids under five then and a husband working in China so the interior design was very just getting jobs here and there when I wanted them it was it allowed me to be flexible with the kids um gave me something to stop me being bored senseless to be honest um but by the time I'd done 10 years of it I was pretty good at it um I ended up doing a few breweries and commercial projects at the end but I, then we started Kate to the Rescue so the it's kind of like I went from left brain and then I went to right, that's right, creative's right brain, isn't it? Then I went to right brain. And then I just got bored senseless as an interior designer because none of the builders take you seriously. They just think you're a shoes and handbags girl that's there to, and, and as a steel foundry woman, that didn't sit well yeah, fair enough. with yeah. me at all because I'm like, I would, uh, I'm an engineer, you know, I'm a highly intelligent human being and you don't get to call me a shoes and handbags lady. And um and then it just happened we were bored and a friend of mine said, let's start a business together. And I didn't want to do a sales company because I hate sales, but she was a marketing person and I was a creative and we, we started together. Um, but luckily, online 
online suits me so well because you just put the number on the website and then when you're not looking they pay for it and you don't have to say I'm sorry it's that much money or would you like a discount or let me do that for free for you or all my sales personality traits they could just buy it and they and I didn't have to physically take their money so it allowed me to provide the service and then having the online community allowed me to say look I'm really really lovely let's be friends and here's all the way I can help you and this is the $50 you spent but I'm going to give you thousands of dollars worth of group service of making you feel good and videos and 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 so I finally found a job where I got to nourish my left and right brain where I got to over deliver and when you over deliver on a big scale it's not so bad if you've only got one client and you over deliver you have a problem but if, if you're delivering to your entire community of 50, 60,000 people, it's hard to over deliver then because, because there's a large community. If you divided them all, if you divided all your time by the 60,000 people, it's just a little bit of time for everybody. <laughs> so I finally found something that stops me getting bored, allows me to be nerdy and smart one day, allows me to be super mushy and mothering one day, allows me to be creative the next. And then, and then I spend most of my days with people writing nice comments. It's like, um, it took me a long time to find something that, that I don't get bored at, that fulfills me, that, that fills all parts of me and, and allows me to serve, which doesn't make the sales feel icky because I feel that I over deliver on such a ridiculous level that I don't feel funny about then having someone give me fifty dollars no, for and, their and cake. <laughs> yeah, and what you are delivering is a is a, a valuable product, sure. you know, to the people who are following you. But what you are giving them, as you say, it's not you're not just giving people a cake kit. You are giving them yeah. a sense of confidence and purpose, and that they're not alone, and that and and a really yeah. supportive community who's going to rally mm. behind them to say, oh your cake looks great you did a really good job and I think that's priceless so really what you're giving people is priceless it's far more than cake that's the loyalty the loyalty comes from the community the loyalty comes from the customer service the the loyalty comes from people saying we'd never buy anywhere else because the service is so excellent and the safety in the community that's created gives me the confidence I need to do what I do people I think e-commerce has become a very invisible transaction um, it's very scary. I'm still a bit weird about online shopping. It's maybe because I have body image issues that every time I buy something, I'm scared to buy online if I can't see what I look like. Um, so I have a bit of a feeling and then that feeling that you can't return it very easily. Or So you have a bit of a mistrust with online purchases. And I think that Kate to the Rescue somehow is a human interaction that happens to be online which is really cool it, it builds a lot of trust and community for something that's terrifying like you're asking someone to put their trust in you to take the plunge and to risk looking like an idiot letting their kids down or that's their perception you know looking like an idiot letting their kids down having their friends you know go go look at that cake and um and so it requires a huge leap of faith, which means you have to create a really big pillow for people to land on um, all the way down, you know. So, Which yeah. is something that you are doing and it's really wonderful. <laughs> so I, I, I will ask you, though, so you met your husband, that's how you end up in Australia. Mm -hmm. Do you miss being in Scotland? No, not, not, not so much. Um, I miss Scotland, not being in Scotland. So... I'm very nostalgic. I get quite irritated by English people who bag England, I, I, people who move out here and then destroy the UK. I'm quite patriotic. I'm patriotic to Australia and to Scotland. But um, probably what I miss the most when I go home is a sense of belonging, um, a sense of all my childhood memories are there. I was 20 when I left. You know, the street corner that the first boy that kissed you, the pub. You know, I come from a very small sheep farming town in Scotland. And so there's like one school, one high school between three or four villages. And so everything is every memory that you ever had. And so that sense of 
of maybe a blanket wrapping around your shoulders. Obviously, it was also the opposite. Everyone knew your business. Everyone knew everything <laughs> about you. And, and a small town with small opportunities. Um, British people are... We're a cynical bunch. Um, I'm from, my parents are from Northern England, from Yorkshire. And so they have that thing that they cut you off at the knees and they show their love by criticizing. And um, so when I moved to Australia, Craig's family are the ones that they say nothing. Everyone says nothing. Everyone stays quiet. Nobody does eye contact. And then once in a while, it just goes, <laughs> boom. boom. Whereas my, my family are the just little 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 nicks at your pers- at your confidence on a daily basis they're that kind of tall poppy syndrome I guess and um and so when I came to Australia I felt a massive sense of freedom I'm a 20 year old with no one to hold me accountable for my personality in any way and my personality is large and and at the time it was way larger than it is now because I'm a pragmatic human now but um when I go home, I can feel like that little girl again a little bit. And and it takes me a while to get used to all my relatives just permanently giving you like a little side slap <laughs> every time. <laughs> like little smart comments and little stuff. And But I miss the greenery. I miss the heritage. Yeah. I, I love singing and I love Scottish singing. Um, I love the countryside. I used to drive down so many of those lanes crying over the latest boy that didn't love you, you know, playing. (laughs) What was I playing? I was playing Blur, Oasis. I was that kind of era. So I'm playing all my songs. Yeah, all the old Britpop. And um, so I miss that. And when I go home, that's what I do. I do the things I used to do. Um, I love that. I love that. So (laughs) Play to the Rescue has over 200 is that right? Over two hundred, think different... maybe two hundred and fifty something now. So wow! Okay. And then we have a load of custom kits. So like people will ask us to make something for them. We have like maybe another two or three hundred templates of those as well. So yeah, it does have a lot of designs. A, a lot, lot, lot of designs. You must have seen some really interesting and unusual <laughs> uh, requests for your cake kits. Um, can you think of what are some of the the, the strangest ones you've been asked for? <sighs> People, it's often for husbands and it's often for people who don't realize how you would ever translate it into a, a cake. Like there was one that said, I'd need a dartboard and a gym on one cake was one lady's. It was a South African lady and I, I can still hear her accent pronouncing it, but I'm not very good at doing a South African accent, but she said, we need a gym and a dartboard on one cake. And I'm like, what does that even look like? How ugly is that ever going to be? The other thing that, that people make the mistake of is they ask their children, what would you want? I'm a big trainer of go to the website, find five cakes you think that you can nail, that your kids are interested in. Present them the five photographs and say, which of these cakes would you like for your birthday? <laughs> because kids will just come up with the most ridiculous um ideas the most beautiful thing I ever saw was um what's Hamish's last name Hamish Blake Hamish Blake has this famous thing on his insta where he makes cakes for his daughter no matter what her whim is and he films it live on a live stream the whole time he's making it and this year she wanted I'm gonna get it wrong but I think it was a a unicorn with mechanical wings <laughs> flying underneath a cloud that shimmered glitter that suspended above the unicorn and that's exactly what he made so he did the whole thing he, he made this giant unicorn he put it on his kitchen bench wow. and from the fan above he made another cake held it on wires with a little thing and, and it looked horrific like it wasn't it wasn't an attractive <laughs> cake but he did exactly what his daughter said. He created a flying unicorn with a cloud that sprinkled glitter and flew above <laughs> its head. And I just thought, that, yeah, that's the other thing I teach customers. Don't ever go to Google because Google is the <laughs> scariest place in the world because it's all these three-tiered ridiculous yeah, cakes. Google, that was is, Google is not your friend. <laughs> Google is not your friend. Not your friend at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we do get some. and what are the most popular cakes there are a couple that that are ridiculously popular unicorns just have not gone away we created a unicorn about five years ago 
and it kind of went a little bit viral on the internet. And then it was like, it, we just sold so many of them. And we already had another unicorn that obviously was a bit dodgy compared to this lovely one. And then about two years later, when it, it sold more than any other cake in all the seven years we'd been open, um, even though it had only been in existence for two years. And then they said, we'd like another unicorn. I'm like, oh, well, we've got this one and this one. No, I've made those two for the last two years. Oh. I need another unicorn. I'm like, we need a unicorn three years in a row. And so they said, we want the one with the big anime eyes. Oh, yeah. You know, a bit eyes. like My Little Pony eyes, and the, that kind of yeah. eyes. And it must have a rainbow this, and it yeah. must have a Beautiful blah, blah, blah. Pastel rainbows, yeah. So I created another unicorn, a new unicorn. And from the day we created it, no one ever bought this poor unicorn. Thank goodness it doesn't have a heart because this poor <laughs> unicorn that had been like the star of the show for two years was like was trampled gone. by this new hot unicorn with the big sexy eyes and the, the rainbow mane. And, and this other unicorn was left for dust. Aww. And so that unicorn to this day has sold more than, than most things. But other than that, um, obviously dinosaurs and superheroes, but honestly, we have 250 designs. I would say for every 100 kits that we send out, there would be 70 different designs. Kids want what they want. It doesn't matter how many cakes we create, we will never have what every kid wants. And parents want to make what their kids want. They certainly do in this day and age. This has become a thing where, you know, what the child wants they get yeah. and so which is a bit different to when my kids were little I used to surprise them with the cake um and so basically yeah now and also the way we run the system is you know what Build-A-Bear is yes the shop so I do yeah and you know the lolly system with the pick and mix system it's the yes. same kind of pick and mix so what happens is is our warehouse is set up like a pick and mix system Wow. And so basically you'll pick up, I'll get an order and we, we lift out the Bible of contents and then you grab a box, you work out what box it goes in, what cake mix they want. And then you add all the little bits of fondant from the big wall, a bit like on Lego Masters or on yeah, yeah, Master wow. Chef or something like that. And what it means is we can have as many designs as we like because we don't create them en masse. You create it as it's ordered. So there's no wastage. Um, and then what that means is we can offer any color scheme. So if you have a, if the picture is a blue dinosaur with orange spines and yellow spots, and he's like, oh, but I wanted red spots and I need rainbow, whatever, we can just change it. And so it's, you actually have to be that flexible because kids want what they want. I, I had one marketing guy that came and worked, worked for me as a consultant say, you have too many choices. Um, you need to reduce your choices by half because it stops people being able to make a decision on, on their purchase. And I do agree with that on certain things, you know, like on dresses or swimmers or, but kids, kids want what they want and a child's imagination is massive. So flexibility is, is everything and you can't have a financial implication. I mean, if I'd made, 2000 of that beautiful unicorn then created the next unicorn the next day and no one ever bought this one we'd have had like 2000 of this trampled <laughs> unicorn that never wanted so yeah we you really children have a vision for their life and mothers have a color scheme and so between those two things you have to you have to create everything Just be flexible <laughs> flexibility is key for everything so well, I absolutely love what you were doing, Lou. Mm -hmm. I, I think Thank it's you. it's such a beautiful business born out of your own necessity, if you like, um, of baking for your own children. And as you say, you are giving parents not just cake kits, but you are giving them um, so much more than that, a community where they feel embraced and a sense of achievement and a sense of confidence when they do achieve that and make a cake for their child and, and in turn give myself the same gift in return yes and I was gonna say and then giving back to yourself which is a beautiful mm. thing and um, I for one can't wait to see what you do in the future I'm looking forward to the to this uh, cooking show <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so <laughs> I've put it out into the world now I've never said that out loud to anyone before it's something I keep to myself I feel like I've just like um ran around naked or something <laughs> no, well, it happens a lot on this podcast people tend to tell me there are you know it's no it's no you know 
it's no, uh, I can't think, even think of the word. See, this is what happens when you're 50, in your 50s. <laughs> I, it's, it's no mistake that this is called the good girl confessional Aww. because people do end up telling you something and then quite often we do get that at the end. Oh, I've never yeah. said that out loud before. I don't know what made me say that. Um, but I think, you know, I think what you're doing is brilliant and amazing and I think that you're a, an incredible inspiration to other women who um, over the age of 40 want to start something new that they're passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're living proof that it not only can be done but it can be done really successfully. So congratulations you, to darling. you, Kate Girl. Yay! Yay! <laughs> um, I've loved having you on here. We will put all of your links in our show notes so everybody can go to your site and check out all of your amazing cake kits and your cakes, and uh, and then they will be blown away just as much as I am. You're you're brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, love. It's been so nice hanging out with you. You too. It's been gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is brought to you by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine, available now at wb40.com. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to quality podcasts. We're also now available on YouTube. We chat with really interesting women about their hard-won wisdom, but it really helps us if you can subscribe, like, and share share the podcast. Thanks so much for your support. Bye for now.